Hey, welcome back in. This is the Steve Gill Show. Glad to have you with us and uh, a great guest back in studio. It's been a while. The last time you were here, we had those Tennessee Love Condi uh, orange T-shirts. Uh, <laughs> I you had, you that. had gone to Vanderbilt, had been invited to Vanderbilt University, and then the chancellor's wife started saying, well, we should disinvite her. So because of our big orange spirit, and I know how much it pains you to have an orange T-shirt being an Alabama person, but you appreciated the orange that day. I appreciated it because <laughs> it mattered to you. That's why I appreciated it. <laughs> hey, we were just talking a minute ago. A few years ago, when, when uh, Tennessee and Alabama were playing, you went to the Alabama game, and you were full on for Alabama. It wasn't that mumbo jumbo, mealy mouth political stuff where, oh, I'll sit with this st- you know, group the first half. I'll be for them in this. It went no, none of that. You're an Alabama fan, absolutely, because in the SEC there is no such thing as neutrality, and so I fully understand that. And Alabama won that game. Unfortunately, didn't pull one out on Saturday though. <laughs> I'm telling you now, let you can be honest here. You know, even in high heels, you could have been hitting those field goals. I felt really bad for the kids, you know, I really did. But those were long field goals. Uh, You know, really it showed that unfortunately Alabama didn't sustain some of those drives because you don't want to kick a 50-yard field goal in overtime. That's that's really tough. But two unbelievable uh, defenses. Those guys are going to be playing in the NFL. And, in fact, you know, with all due respect to to your quarterback now at Stanford, he's not going to see defenses in Pac-12 like both of those teams till he plays next year on Sundays. No, that's absolutely right. These are great defenses. I think some of those D-backs uh, can go right onto the field in the NFL. I really do. Uh, but, you know, don't discount the Pac-12. We've got some pretty good offenses out there, so <laughs> it'll be interesting to see. I'd love to see, uh, you know, I, I like the, the BCS okay, but I'd sure love to see some of these playoffs. A so Stanford-LSU game would be fun. A uh, Stanford-LSU game would be fun. Uh, Alabama-Stanford game would be fun. Anything with Stanford and, and it would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, now the uh, the game, sat, you were there at at the Alabama yes. LSU game. Now there were a lot of celebrities there. LeBron James was there. You were there. Right. Cela Ward was, an, was a, a, a cheerleader for Alabama years back. Right. What other cele- celebrities were there that uh, we didn't even well, hear about? Well, I don't know because I just went to the booth and watched the warm-ups and got ready and, <laughs> and started Put some eye black on. And got ready to go. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, when I go to a football game, it's all about the football, and uh, it was great, great to be there. It was a marvelous atmosphere. There's really nothing like a, a big-time SEC game. Great, uh, great book out that uh, details uh, your your time. Uh, you did you did a previous book where you kind of gave us more of your background of, of your personal, but this was more about the inside of of being Secretary of State. And I think the thing that that struck me most, uh, Madam Secretary, is how much more complicated this stuff is than it looks to people from the outside. I mean, whether it's the little snide, little cheap shots of of the Russian serving Georgian wine when we've just <laughs> embargoed that, whether it's the hypocrisy of the Saudi king saying, well, y'all need to clean things up in Iraq when it's like, you didn't even want to send it. The, the, the little snide digs that don't even see the light of day. And you got to just be nice and smile and act like it just kind of flows off your back. You have to keep focused on what you're trying to do when you get into those situations. Because if you take every aside uh, and sort of make it personal, then you're never going to get anything done. And so I always told myself, focus 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 and uh, I think I, I think I got a lot done as a result but uh, it's not always easy you know we're all human and it's not by accident I mean you know, they knew what kind of wine they were serving of course they knew what kind of wine they were serving they'd embargo Georgian products and uh, here they were drinking Georgian wine and actually making bad Georgian jokes which uh, the Russians are tend to do. And, and uh, you know the fact that you spoke Russian made it easier to tell kind of the snide things they're saying behind the back that that they think, okay, the translator's not going to translate that, but they know you know what they're saying. You know, this is a very good point because uh, I do speak Russian, and when you speak a language, not only can you hear what they're saying in the sort of asides, which sometimes don't get translated, but you can also kind of pick up the tone. And uh, I was always struck by the fact that uh, Vladimir Putin in particular spoke in a kind of unvarnished and very tough way. And so it's awfully good to know another language. And, and again, it's the tone and tenor that doesn't translate sometimes in the transcripts. But if you're there, they're looking at you smiling, but you can see the eyes. And that's what George W. Bush said. You know, that's you right. look in the eyes of this guy, and there's there's an evil there. Well, he was a tough guy. You know, he'd been a KGB uh, officer, and uh, yeah, he's a tough guy. And I have to say, I was a little sorry to see him uh, decide that he wants to come back. You know, the once and future president of Russia. That's too bad. Well, one of the problems that we face in in a world that that is. You know, some would say is without a superpower. Well, you sure got a lot of folks that are elbowing their way back into superpower status, whether it's the Russians, whether it's the Chinese, both militarily and economically. The world seems to be ratcheting up, not ratcheting down. Well, the 
world is indeed uh, ratcheting up. You know, we've had three big shocks out there. We had 9-11. That changed our concept of physical security. Then we had the big economic and uh, global financial shock of 2008. And now we've had the Arab Spring, uh, where we're seeing the instability of authoritarianism. So it's not surprising that the pieces are shifting around on the chessboard and shifting around very rapidly. But when that starts happening, you really need a leader. You need somebody who's going to set the agenda, who's going to set the rules of the game. And really, that has to be the United States of America. And when you look at this Arab Spring, you know, we're being told, oh, it's democracy because people get to vote. Well, people were voting in Iraq and they kept voting for Saddam Hussein because there was only one choice. They voted for a long time in the former Soviet Union, but you only had one person to vote for. Voting isn't necessarily democracy. No, it isn't. And uh, you you make a really important point. There's freedom, which I think the people in the Middle East actually are moving toward freedom. And it is a very important lesson that it is universal for men and women to want to live in freedom, not tyranny. That's why authoritarianism isn't stable. But freedom is not democracy. You have to take that freedom. You have to institutionalize it. You have to have rules that everybody understands. You have to have rights and responsibilities. And that's the hard part. Now, I believe in some of these countries, they're actually going to be just fine because they've got some strong institutions underneath. But it's going to be pretty rocky for a while. We'd better buckle our seatbelts uh, in the Middle East because this is not going to be – it's not going to be pretty. And part of the problem is that what if they choose – Wrong. I mean, you're part of, you know, we're going to give you a choice, but if they embrace, as we've seen in, in the Palestinian areas, Hamas and terrorists, if they embrace Sharia, radical Sharia, that's not good for us, and ultimately it's not good for them. How do we get them to make the right choice when we give them the choice? Yes. Well, we have to get them to um, understand that a slogan, elect us and we will make your children suicide bombers, is probably not going to win an election. Not in the long term. Not in the long term. That's exactly right. (laughs) Former Secretary of State Condi Rice with us, uh, Alabama fan. That's probably Alabama fan, former Secretary of State is probably the order she prefers to put it. (laughs) We'll talk more. We'll talk about the uh, presidential campaign that's coming up. Who might be the folks who understand foreign policy the best way? And we'll talk about the threat of Iranian nukes. What will be done? What should be done? What can be done? Will the Israelis act with or without our permission? We'll talk about it in a moment. This is The Steve Gill Show.